Thank you, honey. So in our ever-evolving uh, setup, we just moved. This is the actual Codex stream setup that we're going to try to have put up here, and we'll do a better job um, in the future. But this is it for now. Um, I'm a sweaty mess because it's really hot in our apartment, and I've been having a fever, and I've been ill, so I'm just getting that out of the way. Otherwise, we should be good to dive into Codex Harlequins here and take a look at what they have to offer. Um, because I'm sick and because I have been traveling and all, you know, blah, 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 a bunch of excuses, um, I'm going to do that thing where I go, I'm going to try to keep this at like two hours or something. It's going to end up being two and a half because that's just the way the world is. That being said, Harlequins are a little bit more on the elite side, so I don't know, but we'll see. Um, but I'm going to take it pretty slow. I'm going to, I'm going to just try to get through this, do a nice thing here. Um, it is late. You can go buy the Harlequins Codex right now. Um, I'm supposed to be getting these codexes about a week and a half before everybody else so that I can then do a review on it and get you guys hyped up about it. But this one was sent to our old address, so I didn't get it in time. Um, and in the last few days, I've been sick, so we're just now doing it. So it's going to be a little bit more of a, like, how to play Harlequins and what we think they can do as opposed to a, like, here's a bunch of stuff you never knew was... was uh, you know, being offered to you. Um, the Codex Harlequins, it's the elite of the elite. These are Eldar, of course, so they can ally with Dark Eldar, they can ally with or ally with Eldar, Yanari, um, and they're meant to kind of offer some really fun, unique, flavorful play to the Eldar race. Um, they're not they're they're very different, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at from Dark Eldar and whatnot. So again, um, just gonna flip through the front of this and show you guys some beautiful art. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and there'll be coughs and sniffles too, but I'm really apologetic about it. Um, <clears throat> someone asked me, I think it was yesterday or maybe it was today, what I think is some of the coolest fluff in all of 40k, and I think actually the Harlequins might be in ownership of of that cool fluff it's way 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 up there i personally have never owned harlequins and i don't really have any interest in owning them um they are if not the hardest one of the hardest races to paint i mean look at these models uh literally just the the, the check mark design style is very difficult but when done right it is gorgeous um now, as I say, when done right, I will tell you, in my 10 or so years of playing Warhammer all the time like I have, I faced Harlequins maybe two or three times in a tournament, and I've seen them seven times, something like that. They're very rare because they're, like I said, just so difficult. Um, they're new, right? They just came back in 7th edition. They're an older army, so they're not technically new, but they came back in 7th edition. And then they've always kind of... <clears throat> struggled's not the right word. Um, it's just that they are elite, so they're more expensive Eldar, and Eldar are already kind of elite. So that makes them a difficult race to play. Like, if you're just getting into 40k, this is one of the few armies where I would literally say, nah, probably don't start off with Harlequins. But at the same time, my advice is always... Get into whatever you think is the coolest. Coolest, excuse me. So let's take a look at the uh, the army as we have to offer. They have uh, mosques, masks, mosque, I think it is pronounced, um, that kind of divvies them up and gives them their special rules. <clears throat> uh, their troops, of course, have obsec. And then we're going to get into their stuff. So HQs, first and foremost. Foremost. Uh, troop Masters, they're going to have a very similar stat line, kind of like a, almost all Eldar do. Movement 8, Weapon Skill 2, Blitz Skill 2, Strength 3, Tough 3, Wounds 5, Attacks 5, Leadership 9, Save 6+. plus. Now you look at that and you go, 6+, plus. well that's terrible. <clears throat> um, <coughs> excuse me. Their whole thing is they all have a 4+, plus invul. So I'll read that for the first few. Some of them improve on that 4-plus invul. I think almost none of them have worse than a 4-plus invul. Um, we'll clarify that as we go, but for the most part, that is what you get. 
a lot of them have minus one to hit. And when we get to their powers and we get to their strategy and stuff like that, you can see that they have access to additional minuses to hit and other kind of tomfoolery and ways to make it hard to do damage to them. They even have a minus one damage thing. I think that's one of the moths or something like that. So a troop master is an HQ. It can take a fusion pistol, uh, which is a six inch pistol that shoots Melta. So strength eight minus four D6 damage. Uh, Reroll or roll two dice when inflicting damage and take the highest when it's at half range, which is three inches. But a lot of these guys fly around uh, and move really quickly. So you can put that pistol to somebody's head and pull the trigger and get some really good damage. Uh, Nero Disruptor is a pistol as well, 12 inch range. <clears throat> pistol one. Strength four minus three D3 damage. The target's a vehicle. This damage has a damage, or this weapon has a damage of one. I'm not quite sure. I think it's because it affects brains, so it's like less good against vehicles. Thanks, G Dub. Uh, Shuriken Pistol. Pistol one, strength four, one damage, no AP. Each time you make a rune roll of a six for this weapon, that hits resolve with an AP of minus three. Does he come with that standard? He does come with the Shuriken Pistol. So if you don't upgrade him, that's what he takes. Okay, whatever. It's got a rend to it. Um. <clears throat> Then here's the assortment of Harlequin's, uh, Harlequin's melee weapons that you're going to see as options. The blade, strength user, uh, just one, nothing. It's uh, Damage is one, AP nothing. Uh, then there's the Harlequin's caress, that's plus two strength, minus two, one damage. The embrace, plus one strength, minus three, one damage. So slightly better on the AP and slightly worse on the strength. Then there's the Kiss, plus one strength, minus one uh, rend, but then D3 damage. And then a Power Sword is a Power Sword, and they can take a Plasma Grenade, which is the same um, for all Eldar as well. They can chuck that D6 times. It's got a minus one to it. Kind of cool. Um, and then the abilities. They have Rising crescent Crescendo. This model can advance and charge in the same turn. In addition, it can fall back and still shoot and or charge in the same turn. Very cool for the Fusion Pistol. Very very cool for how durable they can end up being. Um, I think all Harlequins have this. I'll check this. Except for a couple of the like special characters, maybe. They have what's called a flip belt, which is just, just the name alone. You hear flip belt and you're like, that just sounds cool. What is that? Uh, it basically allows them to function as fly. This model can move across models and terrain as if they were not there. So that is pretty much the same rule as fly, but I would specify that a lot of things get plus... Um, to hit against fly there's there is some reason why fly kind of sucks but then of course fly allows you to assault things that have the flyers excuse me um, the flip belt will not allow you to do that so that's why you don't want to call it fly per se um, but it allows you to move over terrain and move over guys and then they have the hollow suit that's the four plus invul choreographer of war in the fight phase reroll failed wound rolls for friendly Moss units that are within six of this model. Reroll failed wound rolls. Not wound rolls of one. All of them. And that's amazing. Because one of the um, one of the weaknesses of any kind of Eldar melee characters is going to be their strength. A lot of them are strength three. And with the weapons I just listed, there's, there's one that's at plus two, and then there's two at plus one. So that gets you to strength four, or even five. And that's pretty good, right? Um... But usually you're making, with their weapons, the higher the strength, the lower the damage. is kind of the give and take there. So the bottom line is it's not going to be uncommon for you to be fighting against someone where you're wounding them on a 4 or maybe even a 5. But re-rolling all wounds means that you're getting a lot more of those wounds in there. <clears throat> so that's the Troop Master. Then there's the Shadow Seer. Um, let me make sure it's the exact same. Nope, a little bit different stat line. Movement 8, weapon skill 2, blitz skill 2, strength 3, tough 3, wounds 5, attacks 3, leadership 9, save 7 plus. Lol. Um, the Shadow Seer chucks a hallucinogen grenade launcher. It's assault 1, 18 inches. The unit is hit by this weapon, roll 2d6. If the result, or if the roll is equal to or greater than the target unit's leadership, it suffers d3 mortal wounds. Neuro Disruptor, um, oh, it is D3 damage. No, yeah, okay, never mind. It's Strength 4, minus 3, D3 damage against the vehicle, it's 1 damage. Shuriken Pistol, we talked about the Mist Stave is melee, it's plus 2 strength, minus 1 rend, D3 damage. So this is kind of your Psyker, it's like the Psyker staff, basically. 
Um, they have Rising Crescendo as well. Flip Belt. Shield from Harm. Your opponent must subtract one from Wound Rolls for any attacks made against friendly Mosque Infantry units that are within six of any models with this ability. <coughs> um, she also has the Hollow Suit, so she's got that 4 plus invul. But that's pretty amazing. So right off the bat, these two HQs that we see, one is Reroll All Wounds, and the other is your opponent must subtract one from Wound Rolls, which is a pretty darn big deal. They're tough three. So if Guardmen are shooting at them, they're wounding on fours, but with her nearby, they're wounding on fives. Bolters, wounding on threes, but with her nearby, wounding on fours. We know the difference here. It's, it's very big. Um, another way to think of it is almost essentially a plus one toughness, but it's actually even better than that because it kind of um, encompasses more even. So it just makes these Harlequins, which are otherwise kind of dainty, all of a sudden more hardy. Um, and then this character is a Psyker. And they get two psychic powers, and it can do one denies. The two psychic powers is really nice. Um, attempt to manifest two psychic powers. Yeah, pretty good. And we'll get to the powers in a little bit. Uh, then there's the troop, which is just kind of the basic infantry of the Harlequins. So similar stat line. Movement eight, weapon skill three, blood skill three, strength three, tough three, wounds one. Attacks four, leadership eight, save six plus. Um, they can also take fusion pistols, neuro disruptors, shuriken pistols, and then they get the full ensemble of harlequin weapons uh, and a plasma grenade if they wish. They have the flip belt, the hollow suit, so they have that four plus invul, and they have rising crescendo, so they can all fall back and still charge. They can all advance and still charge. They're an extremely fast army. I think a lot of people, by the way, kind of gloss over that. Movement eight, advance and still charge, that's a gene stealer. So a lot of people. If, you, if you've ever seen how fast gene stealers get across the table and do some damage, that's what these guys are. Um, only they have access to in, infinitely better weapons, and they're about as good in close combat. <clears throat> so that is your basic infantry. We'll get to the point cost here uh, towards the end, of course, as we typically do. But just kind of keep that in mind, that these guys have access to all this. They can fly over people. They can jump over people. They can chuck a grenade, and then they have fusion pistols or other... Even the Nero Disruptor is really good. It's range 12. Uh, it's a minus 3 D3 damage weapon. That's that's no joke. So pretty good stuff. Then we have the Death Jester. I'm pretty down on this guy. I think he's pretty garbage. Um, it's too bad because it's a sick model. Oops. I guess we're a little bit out of focus here. I should focus on that. As you can see there, it's like a skeleton metal dude or something like that with a long-ass sniper rifle. Movement 8, weapon skill 2, plus skill 2, strength 3, tough 3, wounds 5, attacks 4, leadership 9, save 6 plus. He's got the Shrieker Cannon. When attacking with this weapon, choose one of the profiles below. Each time you make a wound roll of a 6 plus for this weapon, that hit is resolved with an AP of minus 3. It's Assault 1 at range 24, strength 6, minus 1, 1 damage. Each time an infantry model is slain by an attack made with this weapon, it, its unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. Many models in the unit that are slain by this weapon subtract two from that unit's leadership characteristic for, until the end of the turn. So it can hurt your leadership, and it can do D3 mortal wounds to the unit. Okay. Um, that's effectively, you know, D3 plus... D3 minus two to the leadership. Uh, and that's actually after you kill a guy. So it's one D3 minus two. <laughs> uh, so it kind of wrecks infantry squads. This is like a one-shot kill scouts kind of thing. Um... But that's kind of it. Like, you can shoot, you know, small infantry squads, and that's cool. You can shoot a big one and take a chunk out of it, so that's that's where it's nice. But that's all it does. That's all it does. Um, you're shooting anything else. You're shooting, it's not scary against a vehicle. It's not scary against a monster. It's not scary against a, a super large unit, really. You know, and there's a whole bunch of stuff in the game to mitigate leadership loss anyways. Like, it just kind of forces you to spend the two command points, which... You know, that's something. Shuriken, uh, or, so that was the Shrieker. This is the Shuriken. Range 24, Assault 3, Strength 6, AP 0, 1 damage. But keep in mind, on 6s, it's actually at minus 3. I don't know. Not not sexy at all. P2 has the Hollow Belt, the Flip Belt, or the Hollow Suit, Flip Belt, Rising Crescendo. He has Deadly Hunter. This model may target a character. She's a sniper. Uh, which makes him even more weird. Death is not enough. If any model flee from a unit in the same unit 
in the same turn that it has been attacked by this model, then you can choose the first model that flees instead of your opponent choosing. So then you shoot like a Devastator unit, and he's like, all right, I'll take out these two naked guys. No, 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 you're taking out the last cannon. All right. Take out a sergeant and an infantry squad. So, I mean, it's like cute, and I like it in, in the sense of like, uh, you know, it's very thematic, it's kind of fun, but it just doesn't have the oomph. Um, the sniper rifle, you know, what character are you shooting that's worried about this? Because on a six, it's minus three, but it's one damage anyways. So if it's the last shot at a character, that can be kind of cool. But that's a really niche, niche situation, right? So, I've been wrong before, and if I'm not seeing something, you let me know. And then there's the solitaire. Now this, boys, is where we get excited. And honestly, if you're playing Harlequins or you're even a little bit interested in them, you already know about the Solitaire. You already know why this is. This is why you're playing them. Movement 12, Weapon Skill th uh, 2, Blitz Skill 2, Strength 3, Tough 3, Wounds 5, Attacks 8, Leadership 9, Save 6 plus. Uh, he has a Harlequin's Caress and Kiss. And you can only take one of these in your entire army for obvious reasons. Um, he has the Path of Damnation. The Solitaire can never have a Warlord trait. Okay. He has Rising Crescendo. Impossible Form is an envelope of a 3+. Plus. And he has a Flip Belt. Then he has a special rule called Blitz. Once per battle, instead of making a normal move with the Solitaire, you can make a Blitz move with it. If you do so, add 2d6 to its move characteristic, and at the end of this turn, in addition, its attack is increased to 10 until the end of this turn. This ability may not be used if the model has been selected as the target of the Twilight Pathways psychic power in your previous psychic phase, which I think is teleporting it. We'll, we'll take a look. So he moves 12 plus 2d6. That's an average of 7, so 19 inches. He can advance. Let's go ahead and add another 4 inches to that. So on average... He moves 23 inches and uh, attacks you with 10 attacks, which can be strength 5 or strength 4 at minus 1 or minus 2 d3 damage. Um, and if you buff him up with characters, you know what? Yeah, because he does have the moss keyword, actually. Excuse me. <laughs> I was looking for it. So, yeah, he can reroll all wounds if you have that person nearby. And then he can be a minus one, two wound against him. Whatever. It's just amazing. It's just funny to see something like that fly across the battlefield. And with a three plus invul, by the way, you're you're pretty tanky. But don't... You're pretty tanky. But not super, super, super tanky. But there's psychic powers we can buff him up with as well, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, it gets pretty ridiculous. So then there's Skyweavers. This is a fast attack option. Um... Movement 16, Weapon Skill 3, Blitz Skill 3, Strength 3, Tough 4, Wounds 3. Oh, these are the bikes, excuse me. Attacks 3, Leadership 8, Save 4+. plus. Um, they can take a Haywire Cannon. So listen to this. Range 24, Assault D6, Strength 4, Minus 1, 1 damage. The target is a vehicle and you roll a wound roll of a 4. This weapon, uh, the target suffers one mortal wound in addition to any damage. It is 6 plus. The target suffers D3 mortal wounds. D6 shots on that. 4 plus causes a mortal wound in addition to the damage that it does. Hello. You take a few of those in a unit and you are dropping a knight. Uh, not in one volley, obviously, but like half or, or doing significant damage to it. Shuriken cannon. Assault 3. Strength 6. Uh, Ren 0, damage 1, but all 6s are AP 3. Zephyr Glaive, plus 1 strength, minus 2, rend 2 damage. Star Bolas, range 12, grenade D3, strength 6, minus 3, 2 damage. None of that is a bad idea at all. And I believe they come with a Star Bolas. Yeah, they come with a Shuriken Can and a Star Bolas. Uh, they have Rising Crescendo. They have hollow suits, so they have 4 plus invuls. Mirage launchers, your opponent must subtract 1 from any hit rolls made against this unit in the shooting phase. Blur of color, when, the, when this unit advances, add 6 to its move characteristic for the movement phase instead of rolling a dice. 
all of its weapons are assault. And it has rising crescendo, so it can advance and still charge. <laughs> These things are fast. It's 22 inches. It's an automatic 22 inches, and you can still charge. Uh, and you can still shoot. You're just at minus one. That is amazing. Very fast. Then we get to the Void Weaver. Movement 16, weapon skill 3, blow skill 3. Toughness uh, and strength 5, wound 6, attacks 3, leadership 8, save 4 plus. It can take a Haywire Cannon, or it can take a Prismatic Cannon, which has three different profiles. There's a Lance, Assault 1, range 24, strength 8, minus 4, d6 damage. Focused, these are all range 24. Assault d3, strength 6, minus 3, d3 damage. Or Dispersed, Assault d6, strength 4, minus 2, 1 damage. And then a Shuriken Cannon. Um, it comes with two shuriken cannons and a haywire cannon, by the way. Uh, you can replace the haywire cannon with a prismatic cannon. So that's a lot of DACA. That ain't, that ain't bad. That is not bad. We'll, of course, have to look at the, the cost of these things <coughs> to really determine how viable they are. Has blur of, uh, blur of color, so it moves 22 and still does everything. Has a 4 plus invul, as everything does. You must subtract 1 for hitting it. Um, and it does explode. So this is a, a small vehicle here. On a 6, everything within 6 takes one mortal wound. So the explosion is pretty... Not a big deal. Then we have the Star Weaver. So same thing, stat line wise. Um, move 16, weapon skill 3, weapon skill 3. Strength, toughness 5, wound 6. Uh, attacks 3, leadership 8, save 4+. plus. It has the Shuriken Cannon. It comes with two Shuriken Cannons, excuse me. And then this is the Transport. So it has Hollow Field, so 4+, plus Invul, Mirage, uh, minus 1 to hit, Explodes, sure. Blur of Color, Auto goes six, uh, 22. And it's open-topped, so you can jump on top of it, shoot out of it, and have a grand old time. Now we come... So that's, that's basically it. Then there's this one new thing. And I'll tell you what. This is where I put myself out there a little bit. This is an absolute stinker. Um, it is a wicked cool model. But I, I've had this codex. I took it to England. I've been reading it for a little while. Um, I'm, I'm not seeing it. This is an absolute stinker, and I, I hope to be wrong. Someone to tell me the combo. So you get the Webway Gate. It's tough eight, wounds fourteen, save three plus, and it has a five plus invul <laughs> with the Eldritch Aura. It's immobile, so you auto hit against it. It can't move. Shimmering Arrival. When you set up this model during deployment, it can be set up anywhere on the battlefield that is more than 12 inches from the enemy deployment zone. And any enemy models, uh, and any enemy models and more than 3 inches from any other terrain features or the center of any objective markers. So it can't be near objectives, it can't be near terrain, it, can't, it has to be 12 inches away from the enemy deployment zone. Webway Strike, after you set up this model, any Eldari units you have, not yet set up during deployment, other than fortifications, can be set up in a Webway Spar, rather than being set up on the battlefield. One unit in a Webway Spar can emerge from each friendly Webway Gate at the end of each of your movement phases. Set them up wholly within three of the Webway Gate, and more than nine away from any enemy models. If all friendly webway gates have been destroyed, any units that are not yet arrived from a webway spar are considered to be slain. What is the advantage of this? What? You have to be nine inches away from your opponent at any stage, which is just a normal deep strike anyways. When you deploy it, it has to be 12 inches away because that's literally the distance plus the three you get from setting up outside of this, which still equates to nine away from the deployment zone. 
What does it do? And you pay for this, by the way. This is not free. <laughs> so my first thought was, well, let's go look at the stratagems because there has to be something in there that's just ridiculous. No. There is something, and I'll get to it, but it's mostly just, I, I believe, if you destroy this, you use a stratagem to save one of the units you have in Deep Strike. that They then don't die. That's it. So then I'm looking at it, it says Eldari, and I'm like, okay, what's the cool application here? You could put a Wraith Knight in there. And then I look at it, and I'm like... Set them up wholly within three inches of the webway gate. So even a Wraith Knight, I think, can fit within three inches. I think it can. But that's damn close. But any tanks? Any super heavies? Nope. Any big units? Yeah, probably, if you, like, string them around it. Nothing. There is no reason. And it's a gorgeous model. Uh, I think you guys can see it on the camera, right? Like, it's it's beautiful. That's so thematic. That's really cool. And the idea that the Harlequins bring this webway gate and there's all this shenanigans that can happen. That's, that's like, conceptually so cool. Uh, it could be, like, their way of getting around the nerfs to Deep Strike and, and the way the game functions right now. No. It's literally just... So then I dial it back further, and I'm like, all right, surely it's for narrative players. No. It's terrain. They're just going to set it up. They're not going to pay for that. They're going to put that on their board. They're going to drink their beer and eat their pretzels, and, then, and they're not going to use it the way that it's supposedly intended to be used. I don't know, guys. Someone yell at me. Someone tell me I'm wrong. I don't think I'm wrong. Um, so then we get to the kind of special abilities they have. Defenders of the Black Library. If you're Battleforged, you have Obsec. Mosque Forms. Um, if your army is Battleforged, all units in a Harlequin detachment gain a Mosque Form. Okay, so that's kind of like the chapter tactics. It's different dynasties and all that kind of stuff. Almost every army has the equivalent to this. So let's talk about the Mosque Forms here. Uh, Midnight Sorrow, the Art of Death. Units with this form can move an additional D6 when they fall back. In addition, units with this form can consolidate up to 6 inches. So that's a big deal. Um, remember, the entire army can fall back and still charge. But what you can't do when you fall back is advance. So this is essentially telling you, yes, you can advance out of falling back. So you move your normal 8 inches out of a fallback, roll a D6, add that to it, and then you act completely normally. You're still shooting, you're still charging. I think for a lot of people, <coughs> they understand these rules in a vacuum, but all of it together makes for an extremely different and scary army. Um, they can tie you up. A lot of them have fusion pistols, so if you're not killing them, they're going blat, blat, putting it in your head and blowing your face off. Then they're falling back and charging something else when you kind of thought maybe that's not what was going to happen. It is going to happen. Pretty cool. Veiled Path. The Riddle Smiths. The start of each fight phase, roll two dice and discard the highest result. Until the end of the phase, each time your opponent targets a unit with this form and makes a hit roll that before modifiers exactly matches your dice result, that hit roll fails. So you roll two dice, you get a four and a six. You discard the six. Every time your opponent rolls a four, let's say they're hitting you with 10 attacks and they roll three fours, those fours, doesn't matter what modifiers in effect, they don't hit. They don't count. <laughs> just naturally ro rolled fours just do not hit. Um, that's a gigantic deal. That's a very big deal. Because you have to remember too, like let's say someone rolls a five and a six, well they're doing zero damage now. Because you discard the six but you keep the five and then you know, their weapon skill is high anyway, so a lot of the time, or excuse me, your opponents, depending on who they are, let's say they're they're usually hitting on threes anyway, so now it's three fours and fives are failing, but ones and twos are also failing. So now they're missing 50% of their hits, right? It gets ridiculous. Very cool. 
Um, Frozen Stars, the Hysterical Fury. If a unit with this form charges in the charge phase, add one to their attacks characteristic until the end of the ensuing fight phase. All right. Pretty bland. I don't know that people will take this. Now, keep in mind, troops all have four attacks, so <coughs> that's five attacks now. Um, your Solitaire gets up to 11 attacks. Sure. That's pretty cute. But, I don't know, it's pretty good. Obviously, it's, it's one more attack. It's pretty good. It's just the rest of them are, like, way more interesting, I guess. Soaring Spite, the Serpent's Brood. Models with this form that can fly, or that are embarked upon a transport that can fly. Treat all pistol weapons they are equipped with as assault. Assault 1 weapons. During a turn in which they, or the transport they are embarked in, uh, advance. In addition, these models do not suffer the penalty in their hit rolls for shooting assault weapons during a turn in which they advance. So this is people flying around. Because uh, keep in mind, again, everything that has fly in this codex is the transports and bikes. And they all have a uh, blur of color, which means they're going at least 22 inches. Now you're going 22 inches and you're shooting your, your fusion pistols at no penalty. And you're shooting them at all, which all have 6-inch range. So you're, you're basically taking a fusion pistol <coughs> and you're making it have a threat range of 28 inches. On a thing that has fly. So the idea that you can like you know, put a screen out there and that'll stop them from getting in, but then they just fly over it. That is going to catch some people off guard. Be ready for that. Dreaming Shadow, Somber Sentinels. When a unit with this form fails a morale test, only one model from this unit must flee. In addition, each time a model with this form is slain or flees, roll a d6 before removing that model. On a 4+, that model can either shoot with one of its ranged weapons as if it were the shooting phase, or make a single attack as if it were the fight phase. Pretty cool, pretty cute. I don't know that people will take this. Um, it's it, it, you know, it's nice because it's a, it's just a way to basically get some real extra damage there. If you go all in on fusion pistols, you can come in, shoot, charge, fight. The guy kills you, you die, you fall back, you grab your pistol, you shoot him anyways. Again, that's two fusion pistols to a guy's face. That's kind of cool, and you're reliably, you know, half the time with your army, you're dealing one extra insult to them. It's 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 not bad. It's up there, I think. Silent Shroud, Dance of Nightmarish Made Nightmares Made Flesh. That's quite the name for a band. Subtract one from the leadership characteristic characteristic of enemy units while they're within six of any units from your army with this form. In addition, whenever your opponent makes a morale test for a unit that is within six of any of these guys, they must roll two dice and discard the lowest result. Now, at a glance, not super exciting. Uh, and in the past Codex reviews, I've kind of ranted and raved about how the odd minus one to leadership here and there is just really bland and stupid and not very cool. Harlequins have access to leadership stuff. Um, and then they can ally in like Eldar... Uh, what are they called? What's their flyer called? I'm just blanking on it. Um, it's H something. Anyways, the Flamer Flyer has a minus one to it as well. Hemlock. There we go. We got there, guys. <clears throat> um, in their preview, in their teaser, they kind of talked about how Harlequins can get you to like minus seven leadership. And then they have guys where you just like lose an additional guy. So they, they wipe units um, pretty pretty well with leadership. That's pretty cool. So stratagems. Uh, I will skip over the ones that are the just standard ones for Eldar. They don't have that many of them, but there are some in there. Two command points. Great Harlequin. Use the strategy before the battle. Select a troop master from your army. That unit gains the Great Harlequin's keyword and the following ability. Will of the Laughing God. In the fight phase, reroll hit rolls of one for friendly Moss units that are within six of this model. You can only use the stratagem once per battle. So you make a troop master into something better. It's like kind of it's it's making him into a chapter master, basically. Um Enigmas of the Black Library, that's your standard uh, relic. <coughs> one for one and three for two. Webway assault, standard, one command point for one guy in deep strike. For one unit rather three for two 
Prismatic Blur. Use this stratagem after Harlequin's unit from your army has advanced. That unit has a, pl a three plus invulnerable save until the start of your next turn. That's one command point. So notice how that doesn't say in the shooting phase for this phase, nothing like that. It's until your next turn. So almost, almost without a shadow of a doubt, one unit in your army is just continuously having a three plus plus. Um. For me, this is you going big on their bikes or big on a troop unit, flying around and just having a 3++. Plus plus. And then there's other ways to get them buffed as well. Hero's Path, two command points. Use a stratagem at the start of a movement phase in which a Death gest Jester, a Solitaire, and a Shadow Seer from your army are within six of each other. Remove all three models from the battlefield at the end of that movement phase. You can set up each model anywhere on the battlefield that is more than nine from enemy models. It's cute. It's kind of cute. I mean, if you're running all three of those characters and they're in the backfield, and at the end of the game you just need to jump on objectives or really surprise your opponent, get into their backfield, um, especially considering it's a solitaire that gets just bonkers. Okay, that's all right. The Shadow Seer, the Death Jester... Do they want to be moving around and be in your opponent's face? No, not really, not at all. But it's cute. It's it's a it's a card up your sleeve that you can pull out, and I guarantee you, your opponent will not see it coming. Shigarox Jest. Use the stratagem when, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Use the stratagem when, an, uh, it's one command point, when an enemy falls back from a Harlequin's unit from your army, after the unit has finished moving, provide no... Uh, Provided no other enemy units are within one inch of your unit, it can shoot the enemy unit that fell back as if it were the shooting phase. So, I kind of read that poorly, but let's just make this clear. Your opponent disengages and falls back from your unit. You spend one command point, and as long as you're not in combat with another unit, you just shoot them. You just shoot them. It does specify that the unit that had the guys fall back from them is who shoots those. So that does kind of limit your options. But again, if you just have a troop ru unit running around with a bunch of uh, fusion pistols, pop, pop, pretty cool. Uh, or your bikes with the haywire, all that kind of stuff. So th there is options for this, but it it's just one command point. And remember, you get to fall back with no penalties. So this is just like... This whole codex is about getting into your opponent's face, tying them up, and then and then punishing them over and over again. <clears throat> the Hundred Swords of Vol. One command point. Use the stratagem in the start of your first battle round. Before the first turn begins, select one Harlequin's unit from your army, remove this unit from the battlefield, and redeploy it anywhere within your deployment zone. If you select the transport, all units um, do the same. The winner chooses, uh, and then you roll off if someone has a similar ability. Redeploy, for one command point, not bad. Another just tricksy thing to do. Torments of the Fiery Pit. Use a stratagem in the fight phase before attacking with a Harlequin character from your army that has lost any wounds this battle round. Until the end of the phase, increase the strength uh, characteristic and attacks of that model by two. So you wounded a solitaire, okay, he's got 12 attacks on the blitz charge, um, and his strength is 5, and then with the harlequins, whatever the plus 2 one is, he's now strength 7. 12 attacks, and then if you take him in that other mosque, he's 13 attacks, 13 attacks, strength 7, minus, I think it is uh, 1, d3 damage. Yeah. Okay. There's one command point, by the way. Use this stratagem in your psychic phase. This is called Vessel of Fate. Shadow Seer from your army can attempt to cast one additional psychic power. One command point. Ward answers. Three command points. Uh, it's at the end of the fight phase. Select a Harlequin's unit from your army that has already fought this phase. That unit can immediately pile in and fight an additional time. It just says a unit, by the way. So that 13 attack solitaire is now doing 26 attacks.
26 attacks. And that's cool and all, by the way, but let's also remember you can have troop guys that all have four attacks or five in that one mosque. Um, a unit of five of them is 25 attacks. Swinging twice is 50 attacks. 50. We're just like casually throwing these numbers around. And that's just a five-man unit. That's not even a big one. Fire and fade. Um, that's where you can shoot and then move again afterwards. It's one command point. Dramatic entrance. One command point. Uh, use it at the beginning of your opponent's charge phase. A Harlequin character from your army that is within six of an enemy unit can perform a heroic intervention and move up to six when it does so. Six-inch heroic intervention for one command point. Baller. Isha's Weeping, one command point. Uh, use this at the end of your uh, of any phase. Select a Harlequin's unit from your army that suffered casualties during the phase. Improve that unit's invulnerable save by one to a maximum of three until the end of the turn. So if you advance, you can have a three plus plus. And if you lost anybody, you can have a three plus plus. You just have to lose somebody and then you activate this strategy. <laughs> Mirthless Hatred, one command point. Use this strategy when a Harlequin's unit from your army is chosen to fight. Reroll failed hit rolls and failed wound rolls for the attacks for this unit that target a Slanesh units uh, until the end of the phase. Reroll failed hit and wound is amazing. It's just that you're not going to face that much Slanesh. But they're, they're out there. There's some. Shrieking Doom, one command point. Use a stratagem before a death jester from your army shoots a strike, uh, Shrieker Cannon or Curtain Fall using the weapon's Shrieker Profile. Increase the weapon's strength characteristic by one and its damage to D3 until the end of the phase. So for a command point, that sniper becomes a little bit better. All of a sudden, he's minus two on the rend uh, standard and then D3 damage. <coughs> it's still just one shot. It's just not that incredibly scary to me. But at least with this now, you're reliably probably killing somebody in the unit, and then they're taking D3 Mortal, keep in mind. And then they lose one extra guy when they feel the leadership. So it, it has a snowball effect. It's just a kind of mediocre unit, and now you're spending command points to make a kind of medio mediocre unit a little bit better. Warrior Acrobats, one command point. Use the stratagem in the movement phase when a Harlequin's infantry unit from your army advances. Add six to the move unit's movement characteristic for that movement. Uh, until instead of rolling a dice okay auto six um the labyrinth laughs so here it is guys you ready for this this is the webway gate stratagem Use the stratagem when a webway gate from your army is destroyed, but before you remove the model from the battlefield, immediately set up one Eldari unit from your army that has that was or that has not been deployed from the webway, wholly within three of the webway gate and more than one away from enemy models. After you've done so, remove the webway gate from the battlefield as normal. It's like an emergency disembark. Wow. Lightning fast reactions, two command points. Use a stratagem when a Harlequin's unit from your army is tarred by a ranged or melee weapon. Subtract one from all hit rolls made against that unit for the rest of the phase. That's the standard El uh, Eldar one. Haywire grenade. Use a stratagem before a Harlequin unit model from your army it throws a plasma grenade at a vehicle. You can only make a single hit roll for the grenade, but if it hits, the enemy suffers D3 mortal wounds. No price too steep. Two command points. This is a Midnight Sorrow stratagem. Uh, use a strat stratagem when a Midnight Sorrow character from your army is slain. Before removing this model as a casualty, you can fight as if it were the fight phase. If that character was a solitaire or is slain by a Chaos unit, add one to its strength and attacks uh, characteristics when resolving that fight. So this is making a solitaire go ham. Veiled Path stratagem. Capricious Reflections, one command point. Use a stratagem at the end of your opponent's charge phase. Select a, vo a Veiled Path unit from your army. That unit can immediately perform a heroic intervention as if it were a character. <laughs> so, it says unit. So that could be an entire troop unit, by the way. Pretty cool. Just going to catch people off guard. Um, it's just anything. It's just any unit that is that mosque form. So, 
Um, if someone's trying to snipe a specific or soft underbelly part of your army, any other unit that's within six... No, it's a normal heroic intervention. Never mind. Um, gets to do that. Frozen Star Stratagem. Maliciously Frenzy. Or Malicious Frenzy. Two command points. Use this stratagem before a Frozen Stars unit from your army fights in the fight phase. Until the end of the phase, add one to wound rolls for attacks by this unit that target enemy infantry, beasts, or biker units. Beasts or biker units? I don't know. It's all right. Two command points. I mean, add one to wound is nice, but it's like just add two. Just add one to wound. Why are we? Why are we specifying? Anyways, an example made. Dreaming Shadow Stratagem, one command point. Use a stratagem in your shooting phase. Select a Dreaming Shadow character from your army until the end of the phase. Each successful hit roll made by this model causes two hits. Hit rolls of a six plus made by this model cause three hits. So, DACA. Not bad. Uh, each successful hit roll made by this model costs two. Yeah, that's pretty darn good. It's only for characters, though. Um, so yeah, your characters can still take some fusion pistols if I'm not mistaken. But not as many of them can. For instance, the solitaire can't, I don't think. Um, yeah, okay. Sky Stride, Soaring Spite Stratagem, one command point. Use this stratagem just before a Soaring Spite infantry unit consolidates. Instead of moving toward the nearest enemy model... Unit consolidates up to six toward the nearest soaring spite transport from your army. If all models in the unit end this move within three of the transport, the unit may immediately embark upon it. If it is sufficient capacity remaining. As if it were the movement phase. You can do so even if they disembark from the transport during the same turn. So that's got some shenanigans. That's the beginning of something kind of cool. Because that's again something that breaks the game mechanics and is not something you're used to seeing. But it's very clear. Um, jump out, shoot, jump on, kill the guy, the, the what's left of the unit, then consolidate six inches towards your own transport, end up within three of it, get back inside. Um, that allows you to just to get around a lot because the game is made as such that if you disembark from the vehicle, <coughs> it specifies you cannot get back onto it. So that means getting off the vehicle is basically a, a one-way trip. Once you get off, you're not going to get back on. Um, not anytime soon, at least. But these guys get around that. And that's pretty sick. That makes them even more mobile. So that one's amazing. The Silken Knife is a Silent Shroud stratagem. Two command points. Use a stratagem at the start of the charge phase. Select a Silent Shroud unit from your army. Enemy units cannot fire Overwatch against the unit in the phase. It's a very big deal. Um, Webway Ambush Harlequin Stratagem Use this stratagem at the end of your movement phase One command point Choose a webway gate from your army Either two units in a webway spar can emerge from that webway gate this turn Or one unit can emerge from that webway gate this turn And can be set up wholly within three of it And more than one away from enemy models I'm just rereading it because I just don't understand. All right, so here's what it does. Notice how it doesn't say you have to be nine away from your opponent. So what this is letting you do is get around that. It does say you have to be set up wholly within three. Um, so it's cheating movement a little bit. That is all that it does. Um, and this is as close as you get to the webway gate making any sense at all. Any at all. And that's not even me being a dick or something. It's just literally... That's it. That's the only trick in the bag for that. Otherwise, it literally does nothing. Literally. Because it says already that you have to be nine away when you get out of it. So you're not even cheating distance. This one command point stratagem is what gets you around that. 
if you could move out of it or something and it just cheated that kind of distance, then it would be crazy. You'd be getting all kinds of really great charges. But if you have to be within three, then your opponent just has to be 12 inches away from this and then it actually does nothing. So the way you can, th so to turn my frown upside down, the way you look at this is it can act as like a deterrent you put it somewhere and your opponent's like, well, I can't kill it fast enough. And if I don't, and I end up too close to it, then my opponent's going to charge me. But with how fast Harlequins are, where are you putting that? It's 12 inches off their deployment zone anyways. 95% of this army can get into their deployment zone on turn one. I, You know, it's just, okay. I don't get it. I don't I don't get it. <laughs> so here's their powers. <laughs> Twilight Pathways. Twilight Pathways has a warp charge value of six. If manifested, select a friendly Harlequin's unit within three of the Psyker and visible to it. That unit can immediately move as if it were its movement phase. You cannot use Twilight Pathways on a unit more than once in a each psychic phase. Um so that's just it's it's warp time, basically. Pretty sick. We just talked about how fast this army can be. Go ahead and double it with a psychic power. Fog of Dreams has a warp charge value of 6. If manifested, select an enemy unit within 18 of the psyker and visible to it. Until the start of your next psychic phase, your opponent must subtract 1 from hit rolls for that unit <coughs> that target Harlequin infantry units. Strangely specific um, Harlequin infantry, like that's too bad that it says that. I would have been great. I would have been just fine if it says it's minus one to hit for them. But whatever. That's okay. Um, so it's another defensive power that just kind of casts on somebody and says, well, looks like you're not shooting the troop or any of my characters. Mirror of Mines. Mirror of Mines is a warp charge value of seven. If manifested, select an enemy unit within 24 of the Psyker. Notice it doesn't say within sight. Then both players roll a d6. The Harlequin player roll is equal to or higher than their opponent, then the target suffers one mortal wound. Repeat this process until the target is destroyed, or the enemy player rolls a result that is higher than the Harlequin player's roll. Um, pretty amazing. That's pretty good. Uh, especially if you're targeting something that has really low leadership and the odd time where that will happen, and that will happen then all of a sudden you're just like brain frying them off existence for free in the psych phase. It's pretty cool. Veil of Tears. Veil of Tears has a warp charge value of 7. If manifested, select a friendly Harlequin's infantry unit within 18 of the Psyker. Until the start of your next psych phase, subtract 1 from hit rolls for attacks made against that unit. So you can cast it on an infantry unit and make it minus 1 for people shooting at them. And then you can cast minus 1 onto your opponent that shooting at Harlequin's infantry is an additional minus one. So pretty baller, pretty darn good. Shards of Light. Shards of Light has a warp value of seven. If manifested, select an enemy unit within 18 of the Psyker, invisible to it. That unit suffers D3 mortal wounds and must subtract one from its leadership characteristic until the start of your next psychic phase. So just a straight D3 mortal and also minus one of leadership. Webway Dance. Webway Dance is a, has a warp charge value of 7 if manifested, then until the start of your next psych phase, roll a d6 whenever a friendly Harlequin's unit from within 6 of the Psyker loses a wound. On a 6, that wound is not lost. So it's a feeling of pain. Not bad, guys. Uh, Warlord Traits. Go through this pretty quick. I'll do some questions at the end, by the way, too. Luck of the Laughing God. Reroll hit roll, wound rolls, and damage rolls of one for your Warlord. Fractal Storm. Your Warlord has a three plus and vulnerable save against melee weapons. A foot in the Future. Add two inches to your Warlord's move char characteristic. In addition, add one to the distance your Warlord can move each time it advances, falls back, charges, performs a heroic intervention, piles in, or consolidates. <laughs> Player of the Light. Reroll failed charge rolls made for your Warlord and any friendly mosque units will stay within six of your warlord. That's pretty good. Player of the dark. Each rune roll of a six plus move for your warlord, um, warlord's attacks in the fight phase 
inflict one mortal wound in addition to the normal damage. Player of the Twilight. Once per battle, you can reroll a hit roll, wound roll, or save roll made for your for your warlord. In addition, if your army is battleforged and your warlord is on the battlefield, roll a d6 each time you or your opponent uses a stratagem. If the result exactly matches the number of command points spent to use the stratagem, then you gain that many command points. <clears throat> What? If your army is Battleforged and your Warlord is on the battlefield, roll a d6 each time you or your opponent uses a stratagem. If the result is exactly... If the result exactly matches the number of command points spent to use a stratagem, then you gain that many command points. So if they spend a three-point command point stratagem, you roll a dice, if you get a three, you get three command points. Uh, there is only one, twos, and threes, so it's asking you to roll a one, two, or three, but at that time. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool, and it's like... Very much so a Harlequin thing, right? Not sure which one of those is the best. I think it's really stylistic to, who, to what you're playing. Group masters can pack a pretty good wallop, so maybe you want them dishing out mortal wounds. I don't know. Uh, then there's the specific warlord traits. Midnight sorrow. Each hit roll of a six plus for your warlord in the fight phase scores two hits instead of one. In addition, add one to hit rolls made by your warlord against chaos units. Veiled path. During the deployment, you can set your warlord up in the webway instead of placing them on the battlefield. Your warlord can emerge at the end of any of your movement phases. Set them up anywhere on the battlefield more than nine away from enemy units. Furthermore, you can use this webway assault stratagem twice. You get to put a lot of stuff in deep strike, I guess. I don't know. Roll a d6 each time. Uh, frozen star, excuse me. Roll a d6 each time a model from a frozen stars unit from your army is within six of your warlord. Loses the final wound. On a six, that wound is not lost and the model is not slain. This other trait has no effect if the unit is under the effects of the Webway Dance psychic power. Wardens of the Dead. Screaming Shadow. Add one to any Sombre Sentinels rolls. Uh, made for Dreaming Shadow units from your army within six of your Warlord. And add two instead whilst there are within Necron units on the battlefield. Okay. Uh, Soaring Spite, your Warlord can disembark from a transport even after it has moved. Damn. The transport can move 22 inches. And then your guy can get out and move 8 inches off of that. Uh, Silent Shroud, the final joke. If your Warlord is slain in the fight phase, roll a d6 on a 2 plus unit that killed your Warlord suffers t3 mortal wounds after it has finished making all its attacks. On a 6, the enemy unit suffers d6 mortal wounds instead. They kill him and take some damage. Guaranteed. Kind of cool. Um, I'm not going to go through all the relics. The book is out, like I was saying. Uh, there's some pretty cool ones. What was the one I was looking at? A lot of leadership stuff. Another increase your attacks by one for a, for once, just one use. Okay. Follow choose Talon is kind of cool. Soaring Spite model only. While the wearer is embarked on a Soaring Spite transport, that vehicle can move an additional six inches in the movement phase. In addition, if a Soaring Spite transport is destroyed while the wearer is embarked upon it, you don't need to roll any dice to see if the disembarking models are slain or if the transport explodes. No disembarking models are slain and the transport does not explode. 
So it already can advance and go 22 inches. Now it's going 28 inches. Or you don't advance and you just move 22 inches. But I don't think there's any reason to not advance. <laughs> Pretty amazing, guys. Pretty amazing. So let's look at the cost of these guys. Um, the Death Jester is just 45 points. That is a named character. You don't have to pay for anything, so that's kind of nice. Shadow Seer, 125 points. That's what's going to get you two of those powers that we just talked about. They're all quite good. I don't know that you go double Shadow Seer or something like that, but certainly perhaps the one. Um, a lot of the powers don't need line of sight, so she can be very defensible that way. Um, and then a lot of those powers are pretty strong in, in terms of buffing. Um... So I definitely recommend it. The Solitaire is 84 points. It's nothing. Nothing. Skyweavers are 30 points, but you got to pay for a Shuriken Cannon, I think it is. Which are 10 points each. I think it's the Shuriken Cannon. Haywire Cannons are 15 points. Fusion Pistols are just 9 points. It's like a Troop Master, 70 points. Give him a Fusion Pistol, 79 <laughs> Um, and then the points on a lot, oh, so Zephyr Glaive costs six as well. Power Sword is four, Mist Stave is zero, that's what the Shadow Seer has. Harlequin's Kiss are seven, Embrace is six, Caress is seven, Blade is zero. It's all pretty cheap. Not that bad. The Webway Gate's 120 points, guys. Why? Um, but troop, as you can see, are 13 points. So you give them a fusion pistol that makes them 22 points. And then, like, you give them something like the caress or embrace. Maybe the embrace? That's a 28-point model. That's a 28-point tough three one-wound model. Um, so you can kind of see where that's going, right? Like, five of them... Uh, that would be 125 plus 21. So is that 146? Is that 146 for five? Uh, first turn deep strike. I don't think this gets around that, my friend. I do not believe it gets around that. This codex was printed after... But it uh, the rule is pretty explicitly clear that nothing gets nothing gets deep strike turn one outside of your own deployment zone. <coughs> I could be wrong on that. Tell me if the chatter is uh, you know if there's chatter about no it it totally does. We'll have to probably clarify it in the FAQ. Um, but even then, it's twelve inches. Yeah, it's area denial. Uh, like you said though, that it that is exactly. That is exactly all that it does, is area denial. Um, and that's okay. I just don't ever see myself paying 120 points for that. 14 wounds, tough 8, 3 up save, 5 up in bowl. I, uh, in the comments of this video, because we will post this on YouTube, make me, you know, convince me I'm wrong, please, someone, because I... I know that in previous Codex reviews, I've gotten pretty stinky about a couple things. I've been like, this is really bad. This Harlequin's Codex is phenomenal, but that gateway is just terrible. It just doesn't make any sense. And it's gorgeous, too. It's a really cool model. Um, so that's it, guys. That is the Codex. Um, I want to just have a, just a brief talk, basically, about what this should mean for the meta and what and, and what you can do. I think the speed of this is going to catch people off guard. Um, you hear these numbers like 22 inches. You hear these, you know, basic movement of eight, but you're always advancing. So we're talking about, you know, 12, 13 inches of movement on your basic guy. But more often than not, they should be in a transport like a, uh, the Star Weaver or the Void Weaver. Um, they all are minus one to hit. They have a stratagem where they can be an additional minus one to hit. And then there's psychic powers to make you... Uh, actually, that's at infantry, so no. Both of those would not affect that. But they're a native minus one, and then there's a stratagem for them to be an additional minus one. 
So now you're shooting at something at minus two that has a four up in bolt. And that's insane. That's pretty darn good. Um, there's a stratagem to get things to a three plus plus anyways as well if they advance. Uh, let me actually check the wording on that. Use this stratagem after a Harlequin's unit from your army has advanced. That unit has a three plus invulnerable save until the start of your next turn. So here's, I don't, I'm not proud of what I'm about to say, but here's the argument. You advance a unit. You play out your turn. Your opponent takes their turn. They target that. You then use this stratagem. Your opponent says, no, you had to have used Prismatic Blur after you advanced. You look your opponent dead in the face, like every other Warhammer player ever would, and say, this is after I've advanced. Now, what becomes stupid, and I think this this should get FAQ'd, <coughs> take that to the umpteenth degree, right? Uh, it's three turns later. It is after I've advanced. Obviously, obviously, that's not what they meant. Um, so I can already kind of hear myself backing on this. Um, yeah. I mean, it's very clear that the rule as intended is you advance and then say, here's my stratagem. I know it doesn't say immediately after, but it, it just says after. And that's what I'm saying, man. That's that's why it's like classic GW poorly worded. I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I'll let you guys decide on that. That's That would make me feel pretty dirty. But anyways, a lot of minus one, a lot of additional minus one to hit, um, and then access to four plus or three plus plus on units, multiple units. In fact, there's just one that you just cast it on, and then there's one if it, if they advanced, uh, which is pretty insane. But you really, what I love about this army is you just need that for a turn or two. This is not a sit back and shoot you army. It is so not that. It's not even Dark Eldar, which is like fly forward, shoot you, and maybe pull back. This is fly up, get amongst you, and run all over the place cutting and shooting you in the face for like three turns, and then one of you is dead. That's the Harlequin's army. In terms of the army being allied into things, where do I see this going? I could, um, it's, it would be expensive to do a whole detachment, but this gives a very solid and fast assault element to Eldar, which do have that in Shining Spears... Um, to a lesser extent, Banshees, uh, and then to an even lesser extent, some of the Dark Eldar stuff. So it's not like they don't have it, but I think this is them doing it really well, right? Like you take a battalion, um, like a Shadow Seer, a Troop Master, and then maybe a Solitaire, which is not an HQ. What is that, Elite? That's what the skull is, right? Elite. So you take an elite, and then like three troops is a bit, a bit expensive. So a battalion's a little bit expensive, but those three troops, the shadow seer, and then a troop master and a solitaire, and then you put them in transports, or you could just deep strike them too. I guess is what you could do. pretty good guys that is a that's a lot of pain coming at you and it's pretty durable and it has a little bit of the custodies feel in the sense that you've got one turn to deal with it like they don't have a 3d6 charge off of the deep strike they don't have i mean they have if they just run across the board if it's dawn of war you know you're in trouble um but it's really fun but that also is expensive the fun what, what we're saying the five-man troop units like 148 <coughs> And then what would a Void Reaver has two shirking cannons and a Haywire cannon? So what does that run on you? Void Weaver. 68 points. Shuriken cannons. 10 points. So that's 88 points. And then a Haywire cannon's 15. So 103. 103 times 3, so 3, 9, 3, 0, 9. 
148 times 3 is 450 minus 6, so 444. And then Shadow Seer 125, Solitaire 84, Troop Master about 79. It's about 7,800 points. It's pretty expensive. Um, Eldar has pretty cheap other things. Though. I mean, that's a huge chunk of your army. <clears throat> Look how fast that happened, though. Three transports, three troops. Three units of five troops. Two HQs. The Solitaire is a beast. Uh, 800. Like, just shy of 800 points. I think it's like 700-something. Whoa. That happened fast. So as allies, I don't know. I don't I don't know. I think they share. I, I think like uh maybe not with Eldar, because <clears throat> Eldar can get a little bit expensive as well. Uh, but maybe Dark Eldar would be really cool. A bunch of venoms, a lot of poison coming out, and then just let the Dark Eldar have the bodies basically. It's just shy of nine hundred. Ugh. Ugh. So where do I put this? It's kind of interesting. Because of how expensive they are, I don't know that it's super top tier. And I'm not shy or afraid of saying that. And especially with Eldar stuff, you almost just have to kind of naturally be like, it's probably top tier. Um, but they are expensive. They are durable on to a certain extent. But I feel like they're a bad matchup away from getting beat pretty bad, right? <clears throat> like... I can't help but to look at a lot of things through the, the lens of Custodes, but I don't mind getting in close combat with them. Like, they're wounding most of my guys on fives. The fusion pistols are obviously a problem, but I'll at least have a four up against it. But their biggest problem is going to be high DACA. It's not going to be getting hit by a last cannon. Last cannons are going to bounce off these guys. But a hurricane bolter that is now reduced to hitting on threes rolling ones, that'll drop an entire troop unit. Um, pretty reliably, actually. So, obviously, you don't measure everything as fighting custodies. There's going to be good and bad matchups, but I do think you can go beyond just custodies and say that there's going to be some bad matchups. That being said, I think a really good general that puts together a strong Harlequins list mixed with the other Eldar shenanigans and then plays really well is going to be nasty. It's going to be fun. This is the fastest melee army um, in Warhammer right now. I can't think of... Gene Steelers getting a double move from, from Swarmlord is close, but that's just one unit getting double move from Swarmlord. And Gene Steelers are a lot less scary than these guys, in my opinion. Because <clears throat> they can do it all. Now, the troop units that I talked about, that's everyone with a, with a fusion pistol, by the way. So That 900-point detachment I just talked about, that's, that's 15 guys with fusion pistols. And then a troop master with a fusion pistol. Maybe you don't need to go that hardcore on it, but I kind of tell you you should, because that's some sick shit. Moving 22 inches, and then I take a couple of the moths and stuff like that, and they're popping out and shooting people, killing them, and getting back in, that kind of thing. It's pretty sick. Okay, <clears throat> so that's Harlequins. Um, again, sorry for it being late. This last codex that I just got, the Knights Codex, actually came to the proper address, and... Uh, is here. I think some of this was out of focus camera wise. Um, I sniffled, I coughed, I do apologize about that. Uh, it seems like I always have something to apologize with these, but eventually we'll get into a really nice groove. So now I'll take some questions from the chat. Um, if you guys have any questions, would love to discuss it with you. If you're listening to this on YouTube, um, feel free to fill any questions into the chat. I will do what I can to interact with you guys and talk. Um, I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but it's one of the things I like to kind of set the tone with. I'm not a Harlequins player. I'm not even an Eldar player. I'm looking at this as a guy that's been playing a lot of Warhammer. Um, so that all bears mentioning. If someone's like, I've been playing Harlequins for 30 years. You're completely wrong on so-and-so. That's great. Tell me where I'm wrong. Let's all learn together. Um, I'm not pretending to be an absolute expert on everything. I'm just an incredibly charismatic very great speaker that has access to this stuff and i want to share it with you you know what i'm saying that's it that's all i'm saying um so a couple of comments in here would this be a good army to start off with for a beginner how would it compare with other entry-level armies 
Uh, yeah, Jainoma, I was kind of saying earlier, I don't think so. I really don't. I think this is an extremely expensive army. Um, in that you're either spending a lot of time painting your these models yourself, and they can't they can't really just be. I mean, we'll take a look at a couple of these, but like, I don't think there's an easy way to paint them. I think it's incredibly hard to paint them. Now that being said, if you're a good painter, this will showcase your talents better than a lot of armies. Um, but look at all the check marks. They have all kinds of detail. There's some freehand in there. Uh, and then there's just the standard stuff. But they are a tough army to paint. And then to play, I think they're extremely unforgiving in that they're not a caveman army. You can't just like throw them at your opponent and they'll just kind of self-propel themselves to victory. You have to be a very astute and good player. That all aside, anytime anyone asks me, you know, I'm, I want to get into Warhammer, what do I look at? I never recommend armies from the angle of like, this one's hard to learn, this one's hard to play, this one's hard to paint. I say, you pick the army you think is the coolest, and then you go with that army. And if you later find out it's really difficult or it's hard to paint, um, that's the kind of stuff you can get over. What you can't get over is if you're not that into your army. Because the amount of money, time, and energy you're going to spend on this you need to think it's the coolest damn thing you've ever seen. <clears throat> They're not really a forgiving army to play, so I think that makes it hard for beginners too. One mistake of walking to a Stormbolt. Yep, that's exactly what I, what I was saying. I agree with you. Um, I think there'll be a lot of Vect Cabal almost always. Yep, Vect is... Ages of Vect, probably the most powerful strategy in the game. Uh, Dark Eldar is kind of like the guard detachment for Imperium, where it's just cheap, lots of bodies, gets you access to some really powerful stuff. So that can shore up the otherwise expensive Harlequins really nicely. <clears throat> um, I'm observing, so I don't have an intelligent question, but thanks for doing it in the detail on this. Helps shave some pain off the learning curve. My pleasure, man. In regards to the warp gate, do you think there is a problem with some units being not being good in match play if they're good for narrative theme battles um i don't think it's a problem yeah i was trying to dial it back and just kind of you know some people that's how they like to play warhammer and there, that's there's nothing wrong with that so if you have a narrative game and, and the idea of coming out of the webway gate and assaulting is just so harlequins for you and that's just so cool please do not let me be the debbie downer then you know take that and be excited about it i look at it from the competitive perspective because that's how i enjoy the game um, and it has almost zero value. Do you see any room for patrol detachments or ex for expensive allies like Death Watch or Harlequins? Or would you just bite the bullet and build a battalion? Um, for me personally, both are viable. So Death, Death Watch has access to some nasty, nasty stuff. And I don't think you need a full list for it. Um, it's just kind of one of those things where like, you know, a unit of uh, 8 or 9 or 10 intercessors with minus 1 bol bolter shots naturally that then go up to 2 plus poison or you know you can make a minus 2 or minus 3. Um, all these ridiculous things. And then against certain Xenos and stuff like that, you're all of a sudden plus 1 to wound and rerolling 1s. Um, that's cool in a vacuum and a patrol detachment and stuff like that. But you know if you have 3 or 4 units and your army is built around that, that's awesome too. Um, for me personally, if I... So even for me as a Custodes player, am I going to ally in any Death Watch? Nope. No, I am not. Um, I think they're in a kind of interesting place where what they, excuse me, what they do, they do pretty well. And it's not necessarily even redundant, but it's not unique, right? Um, give them swords, give them storm bolters, and they have that special ammunition and they mow down infantry pretty well. They're not really a threat to big vehicles. They're stratagems. There's no agent of Vect for Death Watch or something like that where I'm like, oh, wow, I... I now I have access to that. Um, but you're going to see some great Death Watch out there. Uh, and then Harlequins as a patrol detachment, stuff like that? Yes, I think you'll see more from that. Um, Eldar have good melee options already. So that's where this doesn't become like an absolute must-take. But just a patrol detachment of like just a single troop on a transport. Uh, obviously that's the, the like ridiculous end of the spectrum in terms of you know how little of harlequins you can take but um that adds a lot 
they're, they're it's fairly durable. Those guys hop out. They're murder facing something. Five fusion pistols. Strength eight minus four d six damage. You guys, that that kills almost everything in the game. Like, um, almost. But then they charge because they're within six inches, anyways. And if they shoot them at three, their damage is two dice. Take away the lowest. Like that. That's gnarly. So yeah, I think you will see that. Uh, on the other hand, being an unforgiving army is good for you. It depends on how you learn. Yeah, absolutely. Transplants, who just subbed, by the way. Thank you, man. I'm a Necron player, and it seems that competitively we don't do so well. Is it only because we don't have access to allies? Uh, it's not only that. I think the Necron Codex... <coughs> I will say, and this is sad to hear, I think I don't, I don't think anyone that collects an army wants to hear this, and I apologize... Um, but I think the, the pretty honest answer is they're good, they have builds, and they're more playable than I think they were for a lot of 7th, where they had like one or two things they could do, and then otherwise they just weren't very good. Um, but they do suffer from being Xenos, where they don't have allies. They do suffer from being kind of elite, like you have your one, maybe two unit of destroyers, a couple blocks of warriors... And then, like, five other things, and that's your whole army, right? Um, take some wraiths, take some lords, character or two. Um, what I do like about it, they did a great job making them very thematic. They made them very fluffy. They are competitive. You can win with Necrons. People are doing it. Triple Tesseract, unfortunately, is a very good build. Um, but in terms of, like, just taking a mismatch of stuff and going and winning, not really, right? And that's kind of... that's. That's kind of the, the poor boy on the other side of the cold Christmas window looking in on the Eldar family eating their turkey and being like, I wish I was in there. And the Eldar family's like, yeah, but you're not, you know. <clears throat> um, but we'll see. Yeah, as Phoenix Sniper is saying, we'll see what, the, what it develops and, and where we go with Necrons. Um, so that's going to do it for this one, guys. It's Harlequin Codex uh, in and done. And I'm excited to see these guys start to hit the table. I think unlike a lot of other codexes, you will not see a lot of Harlequins for a while because it's a hard army to get into. People do have these models, but even the people that have these models are few and far between. Um, I do know my buddy Jeremy Vessier. He's a great guy. This is one of the codexes he's been really excited for. He's a Harlequin player. He's a beautiful Harlequin army. Um... And this codex is competitive and playable. Absolutely it is. Is it better than the Dark Eldar Codex or Eldar Codex? No. I don't think anyone would ever tell you that. Um, do you now have to split your Eldar or Dark Eldar with Harlequins? No. Uh, you do not. Can you and be very successful? Yes. I think that is something you will start to see. Um, and that to me, by the way, is across the board a really cool codex. We don't need every codex to come out and for that to be the big thing. That's that's the meta buster right there. Um, and that certainly didn't happen with Harlequins in my opinion, but it's really good, it's thematic, it's fun, and it's going to have an impact once these guys start getting on the table. You should start seeing very successful Eldar players. <clears throat> Even more so. Lol. So that's going to do it, guys. We're going to wrap up this video. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure and subscribe to the channel. Uh, leave some comments. I do a lot of digging in there and looking for conversation. Um... Future codexes should be coming out at a more rapid time table. I know I've said that in almost all my videos, but I really mean it this time. And we are doing Imperial Knights next. And I can't help but to say this right now. Um, I'm not even supposed to show you this, I don't think. But I have it. And if you know me from StarCraft, you know what I'm about to do because I do this all the time. This codex is fucking phenomenal it is so good uh i it's because i'm biased but it is dark eldar good it is so fun so exciting and so cool you guys are gonna flip um the embargo is not lifted on this so i cannot do it right now and i'm going to wcs austin tomorrow so the plan is to to do a recorded version of this and then have it streamed on Saturday with my right-hand general, Mr. Cobra Venom himself, hopefully taking over and doing that. Um, so there won't be Q&A. 
It won't be organic, but you'll get it as soon as possible. And I cannot wait to talk about this. Um, I have to record it either tonight or early tomorrow. So I need to find some energy and I need to find some throat. But when I do, it'll be mostly me laughing, chuckling, giggling, and just so excited to get the information to you guys. So there it is. I hope I left you the Warhammer boner. Uh, and that's it. I'm going to close this video now. It's going to go up on YouTube. And uh, that'll be it. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you later.